Hello and welcome to this tutorial for the Concrete Anchorage and Mandrel Diameter Spreadsheet which is available from my website um, linked in the description below. So if you go to my website and download the, uh, the zip file, uh, extract the zip file and open the Excel spreadsheet um, you will be greeted with a page which looks very similar to this one at the moment that I have open. So this opening page is the project info sheet which allows you to put in the project information for the design that you're doing and then you can drag through all of this information into the design sheet which is where the majority of the focus of this tutorial will, will be. So I'm just going to jump to the design sheet now. Uh, you can see all the other sheets at the bottom of the screen here. We will get to those in due course, but the most of this uh, tutorial will be focused on the actual design of our concrete when we're looking at anchorage of the reinforcing bars. So if I go to that design, um, I can drag through all of the project information. If I click autofill header information, hit yes, it's going to drag that through. I can give a little description here anchorage of concrete for example. I should also note that all of the cells in light yellow are input cells and anything else in grey or other colours is either a header or a formula. So only the light yellow cells like these ones here are for input data. Okay. So basically what we're doing with this spreadsheet, what's the whole point of it? Well the whole point of concrete anchorage is to make sure that we have enough of a length of a steel reinforcing bar to actually carry tension or compression in the element that we're trying to design. So if I sort of give you a quick example of that, let's say I have a concrete beam. So we have a concrete beam like this. I'll try and draw a full length of it. This concrete beam is sitting on some supports, like that, at each end. So that beam is wanting to bend. And we put, normally we'll put reinforcement in the bottom of the beam, like that. And that reinforcement is what's taking our tension in our beam. And what you'll notice is that at the ends of this beam, we need to anchor this bar. We need to make sure we have enough length on this, the end of this uh, bar, to actually carry the tension on it. And so, so what you'll normally see is like, well, we'll put, we'll either hook that bar up like that, or we'll put a U-bar on the end of the beam to close that off. So we'll have like a U-bar in here, and that will help us provide that anchorage. It basically gives us enough length to make sure that tension, which is generated in this, this blue bar from the bending of the beam, basically give you enough, us enough anchorage to that bar to stop it from like pulling on the concrete effectively. So that's what this, this sheet is all about. It's all about anchorage. Um, it's also about the mandrel diameter and the mandrel diameter is probably a weird name for it, but effectively what it's saying is, let's say we have a, a reinforcing bar. So I'm, at the moment I'm going to draw a section or an elevation view zoomed in on that beam that we last looked at. So this is the a zoomed in section of the end of that beam that I just drew. We had the uh, the bar, the reinforcing bar shown in blue. So we had a bar like this, and let's say we have a hook on the bar like that. Okay, we're hooking that bar in, so that's going to give us some better anchorage, give us more capacity. But there's another problem, and that problem is let's say we're pulling on this bar, so that's our tension force that we're trying to anchor. Well, it's great. We've got a lot of length on the bar. We've got a lot of like anchorage length, which is which is helping us. But the problem is that the concrete wants to crush. You may be thinking, where's the concrete going to crush in here? Well, what's going to happen is that this bar is going to bear onto the concrete in here. This 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 bend on the bar is going to want to pull on that. If you can imagine pulling on this end of this bar, this whole bit of the bar wants to move in this direction, and this corner wants to move in this direction, and this part of the corner in here is the bit that ends up bearing onto the concrete, and you can end up crushing this area of the concrete on the inside of this bend. And so what you end up having to do it's providing a larger radius on this on this bend in order to actually get this to work. So instead of having a bend which is like sharp like this, you can end up sometimes having a bend which is more, more like that. And the mandrel diameter is basically saying if we sort of extend out a, constru a construction line, like a dashed line in here, the mandrel diameter will be, if this is the radius of the corner, of that corner, the mandrel diameter is just twice that, that radius. It's all to do with sort of the radius of that bar to prevent that concrete from crushing, okay? And that's what the spreadsheet is doing. It's, it's letting us work out our anchorage, and it's letting us work out our mandrel diameter. And it also includes a little calculator to work out the tension in the reinforcing bars. But I'll get to that as we go through the spreadsheet. So back to the, the design sheet. Um, and basically, let's jump into this first section here. So this first section, section 1.0, is the concrete properties at 28 days. So that's when the concrete has gained its full strength, you know, it's, it's fully cured, 
Um, it's, and this is sort of looking at the, the, the permanent case of our construction or of, of our concrete building. Okay. So in here, there's only really two things we can input. We can input the concrete grade. So we can pick from a list in here, or we can choose manual. And we have our concrete, our aggregate type in here. Our concrete grade, if we pick manual, we click on that, it lets us input a manual value for our concrete uh, cylinder strength, our characteristic cylinder strength in here. Um, we're not going to do that. We're just going to stick with 2835, which is going to set our characteristic cylinder strength to be 28 newtons per millimeter squared, or 28 megapascals. The aggregate type only really affects the Young's modulus of the concrete, or the modulus of elasticity, as it's also known. Um, this doesn't really affect the design for anchorage or for manual diameter. It's just a useful thing to have in here when you're doing concrete structures to sort of know what your elasticity is. Um, and a lot of these formulas as well were ported over from a previous spreadsheet for concrete designer slabs and beams. So it's been left in here as well, um, just for sort of completeness. But effectively, this aggregate type only affects your, your mean modulus of elasticity value that's calculated down here. So just quickly going to run through all of these factors here. Once we have our cylinder strength, so if we get that from our C2835, or we manually input it in that cell there, we can work out our mean compressive strength, our mean tensile strength, and our 5% tensile strength uh, value. And all of these formulas are from table 3.1 in the Eurocode, and the formulas are also written down here as well, if you want to work them through yourself. So we can get all these values for our tensile strength and our compression strength, and then this following section down here is basically the safety factors that we apply to those values to get design values that we use to design an ultimate limit state. So when we're designing the concrete element for failure. So we have a factor here for our um, concrete in compression, which is 0.85. And this is for the long-term condition of the concrete. We have a factor here for the tensile strength of the concrete in the long term, which is set to 1. And then we have our general material safety factor for concrete, which is 1.5. And so when we work out our final design concrete tensile strength on the bottom here, this FCTD value, this is basically our 5% uh, fractal tensile strength multiplied by 1, which is this value here, and then divided by 1.5. Um, and again, this formula is given inside the Euro code, um, equation 3.16. So this is sort of our design tensile stress of the concrete. And this is what we're basically going to use later on when we're looking at our anchorage of our reinforcing bar. Um, we do later on work out our compression strength, our design compression strength, uh, which is uh, noted FCD of the concrete, but it's sort of worked out later on in the spreadsheet instead of in this opening section. Okay, so that's sort of section one, that's sort of concrete properties. The next section is we're going to work out our ultimate bond stress, section two down here. And this is effectively a material property of our concrete but it's also to do with the size of our reinforcing bar that we specify. And it's basically sort of saying what kind of uh, strength can that size of reinforcing bar carry um, for a given situation. So this first box we come to is to do with our type of loading. So whether the uh, reinforcing bar is in tension or compression. So if I go back to my little sketch over here and that beam again, I have a concrete beam bending so it's supported on two little supports. And I have some reinforcement in the bottom. That reinforcement is going to be um, in tension. And if we have additional reinforcement in the top, that reinforcement is going to be in compression. Okay. Or if I zoom in further, if I do a zoomed in section of that beam, or the end of the beam in particular. Let's do a little zoomed in section. And this is our reinforcing bar. Our FBT or our force that we're applying. We'll see this in the spreadsheet in a minute. That will be tension in this instance, and compression would be something like that, going in that direction, for example. But uh, that's effectively what we're looking at. We're looking at the force applied to an individual reinforcing bar. Okay, So that's what we're talking about here, whether that force is being applied as tension or compression. And then this ULS force in the single reinforcing bar is the bit I just drew on here, this FBT value. That value there is the value we want to put in here in kilonewtons. So I'm just going to put in a value of like 35 as an example. And this is an ultimate limit state load. So this is a design load, a factored load, if you will, for the force in that bar. So you know, you'll include your safety factors for the loading. So typically you'll be looking at 1.35 on our dead load, plus 1.5 on our live load, plus any other 
leading or trailing factors that we have for our load combination. And you'd be looking at the worst case load combination okay, for this FBT. So once we have our applied force to our reinforcing bar, we need to work out the stress on that reinforcing bar. Um, and in order to do that, we need to pick a bar diameter. So this next bit here lets us pick our bar diameter. So I've got a, a 16 millimeter diameter reinforcing bar. And once we have the diameter and the force, we can work out the stress on that reinforcing bar, which is done in these next two sections. So we can work out the area, the end cross-sectional area of our reinforcing bar. And then we just basically take our force, our 35 kilonewtons, and divide it by that area to get our applied stress onto the bar. Okay, so that's our applied stress. And then the next section underneath here is all to do with uh, material strength or a, a capacity of our, of our bond condition. So we have the bond condition between the reinforcing bar and the concrete, and we can basically pick good or poor. Typically we'll be in a good position, we'll have a good bond on our bar. Um, you can have poor conditions and that can be due to poor site work or if you've basically poured the concrete um, in sections. So if I basically done a concrete beam, for example, let's uh, do a concrete beam again, like that. And let's say we poured the concrete, we did a layer of concrete like that, and we let that set. And then we came along and we poured some more concrete up to here. And then we let that set. And then we did again for the top bit here. So we did that in like three different pours, which I wouldn't recommend doing. It's not a good thing to be doing. But if you did do that, that would be maybe an example of a poor bond condition. If you've got like a reinforcing bar somewhere in here, let's say, because you're not going to get a good bond because you've basically not cast that as a monolithic structure. You've done that in sort of in segments effectively. Okay. So let's just uh, let's do that. Let's go back to the spreadsheet. So typically we'll be in the good position. If you do pick poor, it will reduce your capacity by 30%. And you'll notice that this factor, this coefficient of factor for the bond condition will drop from one to 0.7. See, one to 0.7, okay. We're gonna stick with good. We have another factor here which accounts for the bar diameter. And this typically will be one, unless we're using a really chunky bar. So if we're using a bar which is greater than 32 millimeters, this is gonna be set to one in here. And our final formula for our ultimate bond stress is just 2.25 times these two factors, these eta factors, or they look like a little n, the Greek letter eta, eta, eta one and eta two. We do 2.25 times these two factors multiplied by our design tensile strength of the concrete. And that gets us our ultimate bond stress of the, uh, of the situation for our concrete. And we use this ultimate bond stress in the next section, in section 3.0 below, to work out our basic anchorage length, okay? And the formula for that is very simple. It's just the diameter of our bar, divided by four, multiplied by our applied stress, which is this sigma SD, the applied stress at ultimate limit state onto our reinforcing bar, divided by our design strength, our design bond strength of our bar, which is this 2.905. And when we do that, we get out a, a length of bar that we need to a minimum, uh, not a minimum, a basic required anchorage length that we need to provide, which in this case is 240 millimeters, okay? So that's sort of going to be our sort of starting value that we get. And um, if we don't do anything else further down, we don't jump into section four, this will be the one that we, we want to use, okay? This next cell underneath is our minimum anchorage length. And you may be thinking to yourself, like, why do we need a minimum anchorage length when we've already worked out up here what our basic is? Because if you look at this sort of formula in here, we're, we're not really going to be in a situation where we're we're going to be governed by this LB min, by this minimum anchorage length. If you look at this in here, for example, this first part of it says, well, our minimum needs to be 0.3 of this 240 value. Well, why don't we just take 240 instead of 0.3 of it, for example? And we're very rarely going to be in a situation where we're providing less than 100 millimeters or less than 10 times the diameter of our bar as an anchorage length. And so why, why would we limit, why would this be our minimum here that we're, we're limiting to? And the reason for that is that this 240, this basic anchorage length, we can actually reduce this further using these influence factors, which is this section four underneath that I'm going to jump into in a minute. So this is sort of the worst case, this 240 typically, um, and we can actually improve um, our situation. We can use less on our anchorage if we have certain conditions that are met with our concrete element. But typically what you want to do is well, you want to design to the worst case, which would just be this 240, right? And that means we'll end up setting all of these alpha factors, all of these influence factors equal to one. Because the influence factors, these alpha factors down here, they only help our situation. 
they will only be less than one. They're only going to drop this 240 uh, length down further. So if you want to sort of do a relatively conservative design, you'll get to this stage and you don't really have to do anything else. You can basically just go, go with this as your design. Okay. Um, so with that said, we're going to jump into the influence factors and sort of look through how this spreadsheet works and how it calculates them. Um, one final note before we leave this section three is that you'll notice that the minimum anchorage length, um, this, this sort of limitation factor is different if we've got the bar intention or the bar in compression. And we can see here that the compression is a worst case. We need to provide 60% as a minimum of our basic required anchorage length if the bar is in, in compression, which is why I've got this cell up here saying type of loading on the reinforcing bar. That's why you can toggle it between the two. Okay, that's basically what it's doing in there. This also affects some of the influence factors as well in section four further down. Okay, so with all of that said, let's jump into section four and sort of see what it's doing. Okay, so section four is split up into multiple areas. We've got section four and then four dot one, two, three, four, and four, uh, and four which is all the um, individual influence factors. But at the beginning here, you can see it says design type simple conservative, and if you set this to simple conservative it will automatically set all of our alpha factors equal to one and it will gray out all of the other calculations. And so this is sort of what I was saying before. This is sort of the simple conservative way of designing. We just set all the alphas equal to one. We're not taking any reductions. We're not trying to um, sharpen our pencil and improve our, you know, our design. We're just going to go with the conservative value up here. Okay. So that's the simple conservative method. But we can jump into the detailed method if I toggle that on. When I jump into the detailed method, it's going to ask us for the type of anchorage and this is going to affect some of our alpha factors further down. But we can also turn on and off individual alpha factors. So let's say we only want to um, take the benefits from the alpha 1 and alpha 2 factors, which are the factors which govern the bar shape and the concrete cover. I can just turn those to include in here. And that's going to basically calculate these two values, the alpha 1 and alpha 2. But it's going to automatically set the alpha 3, alpha 4 and alpha 5 factors to 1 because we don't want to care, we don't care about those, for example. Um, so it basically lets you sort of go in and pick which alpha factors you want to include um, if you want to be slightly less conservative but you don't want to you know account for all of them and because sometimes as well you're not going to have all of these in here you can't account for all of them anyway for example alpha 3 and alpha 4 are all to do with if there's any transverse reinforcement which helps with your anchorage um, you can take a reduction and of course sometimes you won't even have that transverse reinforcement so you can't use these and alpha 5 is to do with transverse pressure you know, a transverse stress being applied um, at that position where you're trying to anchor your reinforcing bar, you may not even have that transverse pressure. So you would want to omit that as well in this case. But I'm just going to toggle all of these on to include, so we can just sort of run through what's going on on the spreadsheet. So this first section here, section 4.1, this is to do with the bar shape and the bar cover. So we first need to specify our minimum concrete cover, this CD factor. And I've provided a copy of the figure from the Eurocode. If we click on this button here, it will take you to the figure which shows you how to define the concrete cover. Now, the way to sort of look at this diagram is to basically imagine that these little black dots in here, these are the bars that we're trying to anchor. And you can imagine the, the force that we're applying to the bar, so the tension or compression that we're trying to anchor with the reinforcing bar, that force is traveling in and out of the page, so towards us or away from us, okay? So we're sort of looking end on on the, on the concrete element that we're trying to um, design. And you'll see here that, for example, we govern not only by the cover from the bottom of the, uh, the bar to the bottom of the beam, we're also governed by, governed by the side cover as well. So for example, if we've got a, a bar which is all on a corner of a beam, we're going to be governed by you know, the cover on two sides. And this sort of intuitively makes sense if you think about it. If I'm pulling on this bar here, you know, if we've got not a lot of cover from between the side of the bar and the side of the beam, we're not going to have great anchorage on that. You know, there's not a lot of concrete in this like, zone here to carry that like, tension force. You know, it doesn't matter how much concrete we have underneath the beam. We've got rubbish cover on the side of the beam here. That's going to give us you know, a bad amount of um, capacity, effectively. About, you know, we're going to need more anchorage length to deal with that tension or compression force. And so that's what sort of these diagrams are sort of showing here. So this first diagram is basically just a straight bar um, and how to sort of work out the cover. We take the minimum of these values in here, so the minimum cover from the bottom, minimum cover from the side, or the minimum between between the bars that we've got. The next diagram is to do with if we've got a hooked bar or a bent bar. And so these dashed lines here are sort of looking at the hook of the bar. 
and then this one here is looking at a looped bar so if you can imagine the, the bar is coming out towards us here and it's turning 90 degrees going across there and it's going into the page so out of the page towards us bending going around and then going back in towards the page and if I just sort of draw that as a, as a sort of a 3D so that first picture that's the end of the beam this is a 3D that would be our, our bar going into the page the second picture is something like this we have a bar coming like that two bars coming like that hooking up and then the third picture just draw this in 3D is a bar coming like that and then coming round like that okay and in all cases we're looking at the tension force or compression force in this direction or in this direction so that tension or compression and again on this one it would be tension or compression okay so that's what we're, we're sort of looking at there so we can work out our concrete cover this is a manual input so we go back to here we can input our concrete cover and you'll notice if I put in a small value we're going to get a very small um, reduction on our concrete cover factor if I put in a large amount of cover so 75 mil that's going to drop off but it's only going to drop off to 0.7 we can't go below that so we can get a 30 percent reduction on our anchorage length for our concrete cover if you notice if i go higher with our concrete cover it's not going to go any further up and the influence factor one is to do with the the size of the bars and what type of bar so uh, a, a bent bar will give us will give us better results and a larger diameter i believe will also give us better results but it's only when we've got tension on the uh, on the situation if we've got compression on the bar this will always be one okay so that's what this first section is doing the bar shape in the cover the next two alpha factors are all to do with transverse reinforcement which is helping to anchor the bar sort of further so if i just draw that quickly here let's draw a new little sketch let's just draw the end of the beam again in 3d this is our beam like that in 3d and let's just draw a bar so let's say we have a couple of reinforcing bars like that and again our tension is going to be applied like this we're pulling on it well if we've got some reinforcing bars in the other direction let's just pick a purple color in here if we've got like a bar going like that some bars like this when we pull on the blue bars these pink bars are actually going to help us anchor further effectively because in order for this blue bar to pull it's going to have to pull on the on the purple bars and that's only going to help us even more if we start well if we weld this together if we weld these bars welding in here let me draw that in red actually if we weld these bars together and make like a little lattice that's going to give us even more capacity there okay and that's what alpha alpha 3 and alpha 4 are saying alpha 3 is basically saying um when we've got loose bars what can we what can we reduce it by what we can gain and then the alpha 4 is saying if we've got welded bars what can we gain so alpha 3 is basically to do with um, we've got a factor here k which is to do with sort of the arrangement of the transverse reinforcement and i've got another little diagram which shows the situation again so this again is looking end on on the uh, the beam or the slab so the left hand diagram is looking end on on the bar so this little black dot that's the bar we're looking to anchor and again the tension or compression force is going in and out of the page and this bar that comes around here like a link or some sort of bent bar that's the transverse reinforcement that's the sort of the bar giving us the extra anchorage that we want okay so that's the sort of that's when we have k is equal to 0.1 this middle one is sort of looking at a slab situation for example where the bar that we're looking to anchor is on the inside face okay when it's on the inside face um, we can actually uh, take um, a reduction we actually get some benefit here but when the bar is on the outside face, which is this diagram over here, we're not getting any benefit at all. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. It's basically saying that when we pull on this bar, this transverse bar is not helping us because effectively we're governed by this edge distance here between the bottom of the bar and the edge of the concrete. Whereas on this one, this bar is sort of lying in that zone and it's helping to anchor our, our situation. So if I just draw that in 3D again, just quickly. Let's save. If I draw the middle situation in 3D, 
let's say we have our reinforcing bar, like this, and we have our transverse bar sort of running underneath, underneath it. When we pull on the blue bar, like that, these purple bars can like tie it all in. It's going to stop the sort of shear happening across this, in this interface. It's going to stop that from pulling on it. But if we put the blue bar underneath these purple bars, it's the, the bars is going to shear off at the edge of the, the concrete, which is what this diagram is saying. It's basically saying when you have that situation, k is equal to zero. Okay. If I go back to the, the page here, let's just say we have um, point 0.1. We've got some links or something. We need to uh, basically put in the cross-sectional area of the transverse reinforcement. Let's just say we've got some mesh, A39 from mesh. And then we've got the cross-sectional area of the minimum transverse reinforcement. So we can put in, there's a sort of a, so a drop down here. We can either uh, specify the sort of typical values. Or we can put in a manual value. Let's just pick a beam. And then this runs through, works out our lambda factor, which is from the, the code, and then works out our inference factor. So this is the reduction we can get from that transverse reinforcement, which isn't, isn't welded. For the alpha three, this, this reinforcement is just loose, okay? But it will be tight up against the bar, as can be seen in this figure. Okay, so the bar is close up, the transverse bar is close, but it's not, not welded. So that's our, our reduction we can get. And then if we weld it, we can get a further reduction in here. So yes, we can get a reduction here. We must note as well, though, that the additional anchorage provided by the transverse bar welded to the main bar, um, it has to be greater than 0.6, the diameter of the, uh, of the main bar. So what I mean by that, let's draw a little thing in here. And this is just going to be looking end on again on the uh, on the beam. Let's say this is our reinforcing bar. This is the bar we want to anchor. If that is D, and then we have our transverse bar underneath, and that is D2. This D2 value needs to be at least 60% of D. Okay. We can't basically have a piddly little wire in here. So I couldn't basically have something that was, let me go back. I couldn't do like a tiny thin little bar like that to try and anchor it. It needs to have a sufficient size in relation to the diameter of the bar that we're trying to anchor, which is basically what this is saying in here. Okay, We need to be at least 60% of our main bar diameter to get any kind of benefit from the transverse reinforcement. Which again makes sense, right? Because if this bar is massive and we've got a f f you know a tiny little wire in here, that tiny little wire is going to do nothing for us, okay? So, you know, a sensible thing to, to make account of there. So that's our inference factor for our transverse reinforcement done with. The last bit is to do with transverse confinement pressure, and this is kind of one which you won't see happen very often. It's basically saying that if you've got any kind of pressure force, so let me go back. So again, looking at the end of the beam and the bar, this is the bar we want to anchor. It's basically saying if you've got any kind of force acting in this direction, or in this direction, which is confining this, this situation, putting like a pre-stress onto, uh, onto the member, it's gonna stop this bar from sort of moving in and out of the page, right? Um, and you may be thinking, where's that gonna happen? Like, when are we ever gonna get that situation? Well, if we have a beam, a concrete beam on dead bearings, so if I draw an elevation again, this is a beam on a bearing, like that. Well, we're gonna have a shear force up here, right? Reaction force on that. And you'll notice if I draw my reinforcement in the beam, my reinforcement that I want to anchor, that transverse force is happening as a confining pressure, okay? So that kind of situation, you actually will get a confining pressure, which will help you. Um, but again, you know, I wouldn't rely on that really, uh, if I were you, I would basically just, I would ignore alpha five. And in fact, generally speaking, when you're designing anchorage lengths, I would ignore all the alpha factors and set them equal to one, okay? As a general rule. But effectively, all this does is basically says, if you put in, if you know what the confining pressure is, there's a formula here which allows you to, uh, to drop off, uh, again, like reduce the, the factor. So let's just put in, let's just put in 100 for our confining pressure. And you can see we dropped down to 0.7. And what you'll notice with all of these factors, all these alpha factors, the minimum value will be 0.7. We can't ever go lower than that. And there's also a minimum, um, 
a minimum factor as well when we multiply all these alpha factors together here, which is the last bit of the calculation when we get to the design anchorage length. So that's the bit I'm going to sort of mention next. Once we have all our alpha factors, we go into section five, which is this design anchorage length. And this basically says we take our basic anchorage length, which was this value up at the top here, and then we just multiply by all the alpha factors um, to reduce it, to reduce this 240 down to a, um, a lower value. Okay, So that's what this formula is doing down here. The design anchorage length, the LBD, we basically take you know, alpha 1 times alpha 2 times alpha 3 times alpha 4 times alpha 5 times our basic anchorage length um, and then we basically say we take uh, if that value is less than our minimum anchorage length we take the minimum okay and there's also a limit on what alpha 2 times alpha 3 times alpha 5 can be so that that sort of product there can't be uh, less than 0.7 so it's basically some limitations on you know what the minimum we can take for our anchorage length is and as I said if we've set this if we've done a conservative design all these alphas will equal one, and so we'll be based, normally governed on our, our basic anchorage length, which is this LB RQD value. Okay, so that's our design anchorage length. We can put in the anchorage length that we actually provided in our design. So let's just say we have provided 200. So in this case, we needed 160. We provided 200, so we're 80% utilized. The design is okay. Okay, so that deals with anchorage length. This next section is to do with uh, the mandrel diameter. And so this will only really come about when we've got a hooked bar. As I mentioned before, we're looking at the, the bar diameter around the bend. So if I do my reinforcing bar like that, the diameter that we're looking at, if that is the radius of the bend, our diameter we're looking at is equal to two times R of that, that thing there. So what we do in here, we basically got the spacing of our main reinforcement. So that's the spacing between the bars in the beam. So if I go back to an end on view, so this is the beam end on, or the slab end on. And we've got a bunch of bars that we're looking to anchor. So these are the bars that have the, the, the bend on it, like that. The S is just gonna be this distance in here, okay, between the bars, between the center lines of the bars. So that's what that is. Let's just do 200 mil for that. This next bit works out the half to half the center center distance between the bars, AB. And then we basically work through a similar set of calculations as before. We've got our ultimate limit state force in the reinforcement bar. This was a user input that we defined previously, which is 35 kilonewtons. We've got that. We then work out our, our compressive strength of our concrete, because we want to work out whether the concrete is going to crush on the inside of that bend. If you remember rightly, elevation view bar. Uh, force being applied, that's your FBT that we applied before. That was our 35 kilonewtons. We want to work out whether the concrete is going to crush in this region here. So we need to work out our FCD, which is our concrete strength. The FCD is worked out by basically taking our characteristic concrete strength and then applying the safety factors, the material safety factors. So we've dropped from 28 from a C2835, we now dropped from 28 newtons per millimeter. Meter newtons per millimetre squared down to 15.87 newtons per millimetre squared for our design concrete compression strength. So now we've got that, we can now work out our minimum mandrel diameter using this formula from Eurocode. And so basically what this formula is doing is it's working out a bearing check on our concrete. This formula looks kind of complicated, but it's basically saying that this, this bit in the middle here, this A1 over AB plus 1 over 2 times the bar diameter, that's kind of like our bearing length. Like, you know the length over which we're bearing this bar and then we're multiplying that by the ratio of our applied uh, force to our strength of our of our concrete effectively and then we're sort of dealing with all the um, all the units to make sure it comes out properly um, effectively you can kind of think of this like saying if I just sort of draw a 3d a little 3d view here this is our concrete element like that and we have a reinforcing bar with a hook on the end of it like that and we have another one over here like that and these are spaced s apart what we're saying with the um, with that formula is we're saying we want to work out a bearing length on that formula well our bearing length is going to be sort of 
halfway between this this one here it's going to be something like this kind of distance in here plus the diameter of the bar that distance there is your AB that little bit there is the diameter of the bar which is phi and so we've got like this formula here where with, the, with the 1 over AB plus 1 over 2 that, uh, 2 times the bar diameter that can kind of be thought of as like the actual bearing length over which where this bar is bearing i.e. sort of what bit of the concrete is being stressed like what part is, is the stress being applied to on the concrete on the inside of that bend so that's effectively what the formula is doing there and we're just multiplying that out we're, um, we're sort of rearranging it to work out what the length will be um, when we apply the force to it so sort of a rearrangement of a, of a bearing stress check on it that's what that formula is doing effectively so applying that formula we, that gives us our minimum mandrel diameter of 95 millimeters uh, and that we can just divide that by two and that gives us our minimum uh, mandrel radius for the bar and then this following bit we can basically select whether we have um, the geometry of our bar that we're providing whether we have that provided as a radius or diameter if I put in diameter and I put in say 100 you can see it's basically saying we've got we need 95 millimeters and we've provided 100 okay if I select diameter if I select radius it's saying We've got, we need 47.5, we've provided 100, okay? So it's just, it just helps you here, because sometimes you'll have the bar, uh, the, you know, the geometry that you provided in as a radius or as a diameter, okay? If I just delete this out, so I've, I've not provided a bar diameter, there's also a little warning check in here, which basically checks to make sure you've provided, you know, the minimum diameter required or the minimum radius required for the detailing purposes, which is specified in BS8666. 2020. So this is all to do with um, bar bending schedules and, and bar detailing and so there's a minimum diameter you need to provide just to make sure you can actually bend the bar properly you know, so you can actually fabricate the bar and not crack the inside of the reinforcing bar you know crack the actual steel of the rear bar. There's a limit to how tight you can make the bends and that obviously increases as you make the diameter bigger because obviously it's a stiffer bar it's harder to bend it so that's just a little check in there to make sure you're meeting that check as well has also the check on the concrete, you know, to make sure you're not overstressing the concrete. So that's the minimum mandrel diameter. Um, you won't always need to use this bit, obviously, because if you're using a straight bar, you're not going to have a bend that you need to check on it. So that's sort of just an extra bit in case you need to use it. And this last section at the bottom here it looks really looks completely blank. However, we can toggle it on by using this rebar calculator bit here. So if I go to on, it's going to turn on this whole section, and this basically lets us work out the uh, applied ultimate limit state tension stress or tension force rather in the reinforcing bar for a concrete element that we've got so we can either design a beam in here if I toggle beam between beam or slab or I can just design a slab and it will let us design a slab and basically lets you put in you know the inputs so the width and depth of the, of the the concrete beam the cover the concrete cover to the sides and it will basically run through all of this lets you put in all your geometry it will plot it in this little window in here and then we can apply it, we can basically put in our ultimate limit state moment and it will run through all of the calculations for bending for a, a beam or a slab and it will work out whether that, that element fails or not. So it will do a quick sort of sanity check on whether your concrete element is actually going to fail or not for that applied um, moment. It only does the, um, the bending check at ultimate limit state. It doesn't do span, it doesn't do a deflection check, it doesn't do a shear check, it just looks at the bending check. But it, it checks that to make sure your applied um, your provided reinforcement is sensible down here. So that's what this check is doing at the bottom. And then right at the bottom of the thing, it works out your actual ultimate limit state tension force in the reinforcing bar in here. And you can see at the bottom there's like a warning sign in here coming up in yellow. And this is basically saying that um, the beam that we're using or the, the element that we're designing in this bit in this calculator, the inputs in here do not match the inputs for our anchorage calculations and our, our mandrel diameter calculations and this is just to make sure that if you're going through and doing sort of an iterative design where you're sort of messing around with this calculator and jumping back and forth between this bottom section which lets you calculate the tension forces in your in your rebar and the anchorage length it's just to sort of nudge you and say well this force here this 59 kilonewtons doesn't match the manually inputted value further up on the spreadsheet um, so if you want to make sure that they match and you want to basically copy this 59 kilonewton value as well as some other of the input values to the sections above so you can check your anchorage if you click on this button here 
it will basically say, do you want to copy these values? Do you want to copy the biodiameter? Do you want to copy the ultimate limit state tension force? And do you want to copy the spacing between the bars into the sections above for our anchorage and mandrel diameter calcs? Um, and it also auto defaults the loading type to tension. So if you were designing a compression uh, situation and an anchorage and compression, it will default it back to tension. So if I hit yes, it's, that's going to disappear. Get rid of those little warning messages. Um, and then we're basically just going to it's going to set all of these, all this bit at the top here, um, as if we'd, we're using the values from our calculator at the bottom. So you can see it's put our, our value, our design back to a tension design. It's putting our 59 kilonewtons for the bar stress. It's set our bar diameter equal to 16, which was the value we had on the calculator. And down on the mandrel diameter bit, it's set the spacing equal to 116, which was the, cal which was the spacing between the bars for this, this beam situation that we've got down here see it's copied that 116 values for the spacing up to the, the sheet so that's just a useful calculator if you don't want to you know mainly work out your um your stress in the bars it lets you sort of work that out by hat you know quickly in there um so that's basically the whole design sheet this is most of the sort of um of what's going on in here um, we have the save designs and the summary sheet and effectively this works in the same way so all of our my previous spreadsheets on the website which i've covered extensively in other videos but it basically lets you export this design to the save design sheets you know and then back and forth if you want to design you know multiple part you know multiple anchorages and then the summary sheet lets you just output a summary of all the designs on the save design sheet um, and then the final bits in here we've got the version info which sort of explains how the spreadsheet's been updated we have a bunch of figures from the euro code which um, are linked to on the main design sheet. There's like buttons which let you go back and forth. And then we have a plotting sheet which just does, does all the, the plots for different parts on the design sheet. So that's sort of the overall run through of how this spreadsheet works and sort of how, um, how to design for anchorage. Um, I just want to quickly cover um, where the 40 times the bar diameter comes from when you're looking at sort of typical detailing uh, stuff. So if I go back to here, Let's clear that out and let's go back to the, the bit when we're looking at the ultimate bond stress. So if I go back up here to the ultimate bond stress, we'll notice that this formula here for the ultimate bond stress really only is governed by the tensile strength of our concrete, this FCTD. The eta factors N1 and N2, or eta1 and eta2, will normally be set to 1, and this is just a constant 2.25. So if we think about it, our bond stress, our FBD, is equal to eta1 times eta2 times 2.25 times by our f c t d so this is one this is one that's a constant and then this value is from our strength of our concrete now if we go back to our strength of our concrete and go up the top here and i just toggle this round for a second let's just pick a low value for our concrete you'll see we're, like we're round one I'm going to jump up 1.2, 1.9, 1.29, 1.3, 1.5. So we're sort of around between 1 and 1.5 for this value. Okay. If we take a low value, let's just say we're using C2835. Let's just take, say, 1.3 for this example. So we're going to say this value here equals to 1.3. Okay. Our FBD then is going to be equal to. 1 times 1 times 2.25 times 1.3. If I just do that on my calculator quickly, 2.5.3, we will get that is equal to 2.925 newtons per millimeter squared. Okay. I'm just going to keep that written down somewhere. So once we've got that, if we run that through and we look at our our, our, our anchorage length calculation. This anchorage cal calculation is basically all to do with the bar diameter and the stress that we apply. Because we've worked out this FBD value down here. We know that, that's from that's this 2.29, which is roughly around three. Okay. This, this FBD is roughly around three for our concrete. I'm just gonna, do a, gonna go new here. We just need to remember that. So FBD 
is equal to 3, approximately, for sort of a typical concrete value. Our bar diameter, we're going to keep that as a variable, this, this phi value, okay? So phi is just going to stay as a variable. What we're going to do for our, our stress, the stress applied to the bar? Well, fundamentally, we can never apply more stress to the reinforcing bar than what the actual steel in that reinforcing bar can carry. And you'll be thinking to yourself, what can the stress in the reinforcing bar carry? Well, the stress in the reinforcing bar is going to be governed by the strength of that reinforcing bar. And the strength of our reinforcing bar is, is FYK. That's a characteristic value. And that in the UK and in Europe is typically 500 units per millimeter squared. Okay, that's a characteristic value. Our design value of that, because we need to work as a design value, which is FYD is equal to FYK over gamma S, which is equal to 500 units per millimeter squared over 1.15 which is equal, let me just run that quickly, to 4, 3, 5 newtons per millimeter squared. You'll often see that written, instead of it being 1 over 1.15, you'll sometimes see that as being written as multiplying by, let me just quickly work that out, multiplying by 0.87. It's another way of it being written, okay? So we know what our stress is. That's the maximum that we can apply to the bar. We can't go above 435 for our ultimate limit state, stress being applied to the, the steel reinforcing bar, otherwise the reinforcing bar is gonna, gonna foul on us. So we know that. We we wanna keep this as a variable, our diameter of our bar. We know what our concrete um, strength is. But we can basically work this back to what our, um, what our anchorage length needs to be. So if I run this through quickly, we have our bar over 4 multiplied by the, uh, the applied stress to the bar, which is 435 newtons per millimeter squared. All of that divided by strength of our concrete, 3 newtons per millimeter squared. And if we run that through, we will get 435 divided by 3 and then divide by 4 we will get 36.25 lots of the diameter and you can see they just rounded that to 40 times the bar diameter and so that's, that's where the 40D comes from that you'll see on a lot of um, detailing information it basically comes from picking a sensible value for our concrete strength and then basically setting the applied stress equal to the uh, capacity of our reinforcing bar, which is this value here, the FYD, or the 435. And that's how we get to our 40D, okay? Um, quite useful to know. And of course, this one here, this 40D, doesn't account for any of this, these reductions that we've got, you know, these, these influence factors. So this 40D is actually, you know, a very good conservative value to take for all of our laps and all of our, or, you know, um, anchorage that we've got on a, on a project, okay? Um, so yeah, so that's basically it. Um, I hope this was useful and um, yeah, I'll catch you in the next one. Bye-bye.